witnessing the hardships of the pilgrims to Tibet, escaping through Death Valley, and listening to hymns in the most remote church in China. These are some of the highlights of an amazing adventure along the 1,500-year-old Tea and Horse Trail. Travelogue takes you on a legendary and perilous journey, joining a modern-day caravan as it winds its way among the rugged mountains from Yunnan to Tibet. It's a journey through a land of almost untouched culture and natural beauty. Retracing this fabled cultural and economic lifeline in China's history, join Travelogue on a three-part series, Adventure on the Tea and Horse Trail. In the first part of the Tea and Horse Trail adventure, we made our way from Lijiang in Yunnan all the way to Dechen near the border of Tibet. We visited the biggest Buddhist temple in Yunnan, learned to make special Tibetan butter tea, and played vineyard games at the foot of the Mingyong Glacier. It was action-packed, but I guarantee you there's plenty more to come. Welcome to a travel log special. It's our third day of the Chama Gudao Trail that we're taking, and uh, we had to get up very, very early. It's actually now about 6:30, but we had to be up at 5:30 uh, to ensure that we've got uh, enough time to pack all of our stuff and have some breakfast. We're going to be driving for most of today, probably about over 300 kilometers towards uh, the uh, salt wells known as Yanjing, where I'll finally get to see what red salt and white salt, well, I've, I've seen white salt before, but red salt uh, really looks like. And then on towards Tibet, very exciting. <laughs> We're slowly making our way through treacherous terrain into Tibet. We're driving alongside the Lansung River, whose tributaries affect the lives of over 60 million people in various ways, including food, water, and transport. Sometimes you need to pay a price to see places of such beauty, and our cross to bear is the road. It really reinforces how far I feel from the modern world. Now this is a real adventure. We've been on the road for about three hours now, and uh, in all honesty, it's probably been the bumpiest ride I've ever, ever been on. There aren't any built roads yet, and uh, what they're trying to do, as you can come see, is they're just concentrating on clearing the rocks. As you can see, that's why we've had to take a quick toilet stop, uh, so that we have a chance to actually get rid of the rocks and then drive on. We come across a group of men carving rock out of the side of a mountain. They're building a road further up the trail. Price for this, around 2 million RMB per kilometre. To call this a dirt road is an understatement. Still, this hardly comes as a surprise, considering it's a relatively underdeveloped part of the country. The route often finds itself victim to falling rocks and landslides. Actually, our trip to Yanjing is almost cancelled due to a landslide shutting off our path. Luckily, the good weather saves us. You have to be prepared to clear the debris off the road if you want to continue. I guess it's what generations of the Maguoto had to do. In some respects, they still actually use the horses now to carry things across treacherous lands like these. And uh, to be honest, they look more at ease on this road than we do in this big car. I wanted to chat with them and maybe hitch a faster ride. Well, we've left the cars behind for the last couple of uh, meters or so. We're just traveling along, seeing what it would actually feel like to be uh, walking along with uh, the Maguoto on the Chamaguda. It's pretty tiring just walking, actually, to be honest. <laughs> Tradition and modernity. Cars and horses traveling at the same pace on the tea and horse trail. Interestingly, they tell me later that horses weren't always the animal of choice. 
Often donkeys were preferred because they can adapt better to the adverse weather conditions. Now here's an uncommon sight: a Christian church in a Tibetan architectural style. I'm actually extremely excited about this part of the journey. I've arrived at the only Christian church in the whole of Tibet, and it was established here 150 years ago by a French missionary. The church was built in the late 19th century by French missionaries from the Paris Foreign Missionary Society. The priest in residence at the church tells me that there are about 800 Christians in that area, and that they all get along very well with their Buddhist neighbours. Inter-religious marriages are quite common here, and people often keep to their own faith, following one's matrimonial union. The whole group is fascinated by the church, but especially with the people singing inside. What I find fascinating is that the hymns are sung in Tibetan. Whilst most of the others are busy taking pictures, I sit back and enjoy the hymns. As for the hymn books, they are over 100 years old. I also come across a Tibetan Bible, which I'm told was first printed in 1948. When I think about it, it's quite remarkable to find what is the most widely read book in Western countries here in remotest Tibet. Not far from the church along the Lansan River, we come to what the locals call the salt wells. Yanjing, which literally means salt well, has made its name by producing salt for the past 1500 years. The Yanjing section of the Tian Horse Trail is the key link between the kingdom of Tubo in Tibet and the kingdom of Nanjiao in Yunnan. Down through the centuries, these two kingdoms regularly came to blows over the salt fields. Their rivalry is hardly surprising when you think that in the days of Tubo, salt was more expensive than gold. It's said that at its height, Yanjing would welcome between 400 and 500 horses a day passing along the Tian Horse Trail. In these parts, it's the women who tend the salt fields. They collect the salt, while their menfolk maintain the facilities and transport the salt for sale. The women carry buckets of water each weighing about 30 kilograms up from the wells and pour the water over the platforms. The salt is harvested from these platforms, covered with smoothly packed red earth rising up the sides of the gorge on stilts. A second harvest of the salt stalactite yields something quite unusual, red salt. The change is achieved by allowing the water to remain in the pools and evaporate. The reddish salt left behind takes its colour from the iron oxide in the earth 